Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mary Thompson. I'm a Master Gardener volunteer for the state of Wisconsin. I received my education from the University of Wisconsin. And my friend Ruth is going to be here with, uh, with us today, as well as Patrick, who is the state bee inspector, and Alan Liu, who is standing behind the camera, who made this whole thing come together today. What the topic is that we're going to be talking about today is probably one of the most important things that you will hear about in the near future. Why are solitary bees important? What do you think of when you hear the word bee? Well, most people think of a honeybee or a bumblebee. When you think of native bees or solitary bees, what do you think of? If you think of them at all. Did you know that there are a bees that live only to build nests, brood nests for their offspring, making thousands of trips for building materials and food for their offspring, and they do it all alone, hence solitary bees. So let's get to know the engine that drives the lives of solitary bees, the female solitary bee. The life cycle of the female solitary bee is very brief. In most cases, six to eight weeks from the time that they come out of their brood chamber and begin their active little lives. The males in any brood chamber leave the cells that they had matured in before the females. They then wait near the brood chambers for a few days until the females emerge, at which time they will fertilize them. After fertilization, sadly guys, this is the truth, the males are no longer needed. Then they wander off to eat pollen and drink nectar and in most cases contribute to plant pollinization. Once fertilized, the females begin their life's work. Each female bee begins to collect materials that they use to build broods in their underground homes or in dry or hollow plant stems, in rotted tree stumps, and in other hollow places. Different bee types use different materials. Leafcutter bees, unique little critters, cut precisely round slices of leaf to use as the material to separate the cells in their brood chambers. Um, let's see. Mason bees use mud. Cellophane bees exude a material that looks like and even acts like cellophane. Some make elaborate underground brood chambers that are truly amazing. There have been documented broods uh, that have reached down into the earth as far as eight feet. Imagine that, a little bill, a bee one little bee making a brood that goes eight feet into the ground. This is not a simple task. It takes time and great engineering ability. They adapt the environment where they have chosen to rest by tailoring it to their own use. For example, some ground nesters use secretions from their salivary glands and their abdominal glands to coat the walls inside a damp nest chamber to keep fungus from growing there and endangering their offspring. Some make brood chambers just large enough to house a single offspring. Their lives are focused completely on making brood chambers that will assure that their species survives. Into these chambers, the females place food so the baby bees have something to eat while inside those protected little cells. This food is made up of pollen and some nectar, which the female bee turns into a kind of bee bread or bee loaf. They put food in each of the cells that they create, lay a single egg in the cell, and close it up, moving forward until the brood chambers are filled. It's a long tube. Depending on where it is, it could be anywhere from the, a hollow plant stem to a board place inside, a, inside a, a log, many different places. 
Okay, a mature female will lay about 25 eggs during her short little life. That's not very many, just 25 little eggs. In order to locate food for her young, she may fly as many as 35,000 trips to the nearest flowers in order to get the food that she needs for her infant babies, for her uh, larva. She's a highly efficient uh, pollinator, up to three times more efficient than her bee cousins. As she collects pollen and nectar for her brood, she becomes the carrier of pollen grains on her body. And we're all familiar, all of us who love bees know that bees have little jointed hairs on their bodies and they, they carry pollen. Pollen catches it in these little hairs and it is carried from one flower to the next. A couple get shed here, a couple get shed there. Okay. Solitary uh, bees are known as dry pollinators because their focus is on collecting pollen. While hive bees, like Apis mellifera, the uh, European honeybee, uh, they are called wet pollinators because they focus on collecting nectar, which is uh, taken back to the hive and eventually becomes honey. Because of the critical difference, Professor Brian Danforth, an entomologist at Cornell University, says that native or solitary bees are two to three times more efficient as pollinators than their communal cousins. Hive bees, however, can be moved by farmers to areas that need pollination. We were talking before the program began about the almond groves in California. People who own lots of bees move them to California in the, in the season for pollination. This makes them a highly valuable resource for agriculture. Here in Wisconsin, there are approximately 400 varieties, verified varieties of solitary or native bees, and almost certainly more have not been identified yet, but are still waiting to be out there, waiting to be identified. This unique category of bees includes various species of minor bees, mason bees, leafcutter bees, sweat bees, which we're all familiar with, I'm sure, and others. Bees are found quite literally all over the world, except in Antarctica. To date, man has identified more than 20,000 varieties of solitary bees. Native to nearly every corner of the world, they are adapted to a vast diversity of climates and habitats. Uh, more than 4,500 species are native to North America. That number continues to grow as new species are, uh, uh, again, discovered and identified. Now the commonality between types of bees is their physical structure. The bodies of these bees are divided into three parts. The head with two antennae, a torso with six legs, and an abdomen. All bees have branched hairs, I mentioned that earlier, somewhere on their bodies and two pairs of wings. If it doesn't have two pairs of wings, it's not a bee. Only female bees have stingers, which are modified ovipositors, the organs originally used to lay eggs. They are no longer, that has adapted over time. They range in size from as tiny as an apple seed to as la a large as an inch long. Imagine a bee that big. Some resemble, uh, some resemble their honeybee and bumblebee cousins. Others look like wasps, house flies, or winged ants. Some nest in plant de debris, as I mentioned before, or old tree trunks. Um, others, about 75% of solitary bees, and here's the real kicker, are ground nesters. They live underground. Ground nesters may do with some, what some call cuckoo's neck nest nesting. They, they may, uh, the cuckoo bird is notorious for hijacking the nests of other birds. 
They'll lay their eggs in somebody else's nest, and that mom, the, the other mom, will raise their babies for them. Bees may use empty nests, but they certainly wouldn't hijack one that was already full. That has to be vacant. They find vacant mouse holes uh, and other type of insect holes that are still waiting there for them to take over. If a vacant nest is not available, they will look for an area of bare ground. This is where you come in. Leave something bare. Leave it bare, something bare in your garden give it, to give them a spot to dig. Look for bare ground and tunnel, they will look for bare ground and come, tunnel down into the earth and make a system of tunnels where they can raise their young. Some will nest, as I said before, in dry and hollow plant stems, holes in trees, and other hollow plant debris that offer safety and security, which is primary because they're just little tiny insects. One question often arises, do solitary bees sting? Well, the answer is they can, but they hardly ever do. They don't make or store honey, and without a hive to defend, they rarely, if ever, sting. Usually they sting only under adverse conditions when they feel threatened. And that makes sense, right? Unlike honeybees, solitary bees do not die after stinging. So it is possible, although very unlikely, that they could sting more than once. Solitary bees don't congregate in groups, so there is no da danger of a swarm of angry solitary bees attacking when provoked. So, now that you know all about who solitary bees are, let's address the question of why they are so important. Anyone know? Anybody? It's simple and actually very important to the success of our food supply. Without insect pollinization, about 75% of the, of the food supply that feeds you and I would not get pollinated. Without bees. Without pollination, most plants can't make fruits or vegetables or seeds to carry on the species. For reference, take a look at this poster, which is provided to us by Whole Foods Market. And on the top, we have a picture of a full produce department with the benefit of pollinators. On the bottom is a picture of what the same pollination, the same produce department would look like without the benefit of insect pollinators. Kind of scary, huh? What we hope to accomplish here today is to help you understand the importance of these tiny creatures and the huge part they play in whether or not you can have apples for a snack, cherries for that pie that you've been longing for, green peppers to put in your salad, beets to eat with your dinner, and hundreds of other food plants that depend on the vital services that only pollinators can provide. Bees are our friends, and sadly they are dying in record numbers because of habitat loss and overuse of pesticides. We have handouts here. Uh, it, everyone should get a packet. Uh, okay, where am I? Sorry, lost my thread here. We have handouts that can help you to protect the pollinators uh, that visit your yard and garden. We have a special guest with us today. Patrick Sizemore is the vice president of the Rock County Beekeepers Association. In addition to that, he is also the state bee inspector for Western Wisconsin. We are very glad to have him here with us today. In this critical role, he conducts voluntary apiary inspections from May through October. He is here to tell us about communal or hive bees. And that, is, that concludes my segment of this program. Um, next, Ruth. Patrick's next. Okay, Patrick's oh. next. Patrick. Hi, hi everybody. Um, yeah, so I uh, represent the Rock County Beekeepers, uh, our local uh, bee club. Uh, we've been a bee club since 1928, one of the oldest bee clubs in the state. Um, and I also work for the uh, Department of Agriculture uh, as a bee inspector. And so I go around and I make sure all the bees are, are nice and healthy. 
um, pest and disease free and um, yeah so unlike unlike native bees um, honeybees live in social colonies which means they live with um, thousands thousands of bees in, in one colony uh, we keep them in in boxes so that we're able to uh, manipulate them and move them around and take them to go pollinate things like pumpkins or apples or almonds or cranberries things like that um, what have you got there so i brought a few things here we have um, a couple tools we use to um, look at the bees we have a tool to ins open the boxes up we have um, this is a a smoker and we fill this with um, maybe some pine needles or something uh, to create a little bit of smoke. This um, helps us to work the bees by um, distracting them a little bit. That way they can't tell the other bees, hey, someone's here. Um, I also have uh, a veil. So I wear this to help uh, protect me to not get stung in the face or in the head. And um, also brought with some some comb honey so um, honeybees uh, as in the name they they do produce honey they bring back nectar from all the plants uh, they they eat the honey or the nectar it goes into what's called a honey stomach and then they regurgitate it when they come back to the hive and they store it away for later use uh, it's very important that the bees um, eat the the nectar and because it, it mixes with enzymes in their stomach uh, and then the enzymes help the the nectar turn into to honey. So my name is Ruth and I'm going to talk about what you can do to help bees in your neighborhood and it's really really important you can really make a big difference because how far do honeybees fly, Patrick? Honeybees fly anywhere from um, a mile and a half to, to five miles. Okay. But typically about, th I would say, three miles. Okay. Yeah. And bumblebees may fly up to a mile, but most of the native bees live their entire lives within a few hundred feet of where they're born. They never fly any further than maybe the length of a football field. So if they, for them to stay healthy and for populations to stay high, they need to have things to eat within that short a space. So you really can make a difference in your neighborhood and help make sure that your bees do well. So I'm gonna talk about how you can arrange a garden to help your bees and I've got five things to talk about. Um, the first, and I'll run through them quick and then I'll go into a little bit more detail. The first one is cut back or eliminate pesticides. You know, if you want to have more bees, it just makes sense. Don't kill them off, right? Okay, so that's number one. Number two, native bees. Hmm, what do they want to eat? Well, oddly enough, they really like native plants. So try to plant as many native plants as you can. And then when you are choosing what plants to put in your garden, look for a lot of different variety, okay? The more variety you have in terms of blooming from the beginning of the season all the way to the end, and having lots of different colors because different pollinators are attracted to different colors and also different flower shapes, okay? And then item number four is planting clumps of, so you wouldn't want to have just one bee balm plant, you'd want to have four or five of them. And then if you have the space, the other thing you can do is to provide some habitat for them so I'll go into a little more detail, but those are my five things, all right? 
So number one, no pesticides, all right? Um, it does make sense, right? If you want to improve the population, you don't kill them off, okay? Except, and some people will tell you that there are pesticides that are not toxic to bees, except maybe what they mean is it doesn't kill them if you spray it on, it doesn't kill them right away if you spray it on them, but it may, some of them, sometimes they get weak and disoriented and they can't find their way back home. So they're not going to be raising families if they can't find their way home. And there are some pesticides that are called systemic pesticides that are sucked up into the plant. They get inside the entire, they're not just sitting on the surface, they're inside the plant. And the bees are eating the nectar and the pollen. And so when they eat those things or they take them back to feed to their babies, they can, there can be pesticide in the pollen and the nectar. So um, try to find alternatives to using pesticides. If you have a nice, healthy, mixed planting in your garden, you're not likely to end up with a big insect or um, disease problem if you have nicely spaced out plants. Okay, so you can do that. You can decide that, well, there's something chewing on these leaves over here, but you know, they're not killing the plant. So maybe, maybe I can let them eat some of this and, and we can live together. That's a fine thing to do. A third thing you can do is if you, do, if you have some bugs, but not too many, is you can take a can of soapy water and you can just flick the bugs into the soapy water and let them drown instead of spraying them with something, you know, the, the bugs that you don't want that are, that are eating your plants. So, and the last thing I, um, I can suggest is I, I said that some systemic pesticides get inside the plant and get, in, get into the pollen and the nectar. And sometimes those plants are treated before you buy them at the nursery. So you may buy them already infected with the, with the pesticide. So it helps if you ask at the nursery, do they know if your plants that you're considering buying have been treated with some sort of systemic pesticide? And then you have to decide, is it worth buying them? Hmm, maybe I can find some place. And then that will signal to the garden center as well that you prefer them without the systemic insecticide. So those are some things that you can do to help redo that, reduce and, or eliminate the pesticides. If you do run into a situation where a pesticide is the only thing that makes sense, if you've got a large area, if you've got a really bad infestation, there are ways to apply it that are less harmful to the bees. Okay, Patrick, what temperature do honeybees fly at? 57 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, so if it's cooler than 57, and what time do they go home at night? Mm, before dark, so uh, around dusk, I would, yeah. Okay, so it sounds silly to say you could go out there after, after dark and spray, but if you can, if you have to spray but if you can wait until late in the day or early in the day and make sure that there's no wind those are safer ways to apply your insecticides than the middle of the afternoon or the middle of the morning wait for the bees to go home if you can okay i said number two was choose native plants now the theory is that the native bees and the native plants evolved at the same time so it makes sense that um, the bees would do better with the native plants, but that's just a theory. We don't know for sure if that's the reason why, but we do know that it's a fact that studies have shown that the more native plants you include in your bee garden, the more native bees and beneficial insects you're going to have. So. I don't know for sure that that's the why, but that is the fact. All right, so, and then for your native plants, as you choose them, as always, make sure you get plants that are good for the kind of space you have. 
So if you have sun, make sure they're sun plants. If you have shade, make sure they're shade plants. If it's a, a wetter soil, make sure, you know, look for varieties that do better in wetter soil. So right plant, right place. And don't forget, I mean, we're, we have a pollinator garden here that's almost exclusively um, flowering, you know, little flowering plants. But look what we have here. We have an apple tree and a crab apple tree. And I believe this is a locust tree. And, you know, so there are trees and shrubs that are also good for bees. So don't forget to think about those when you think about what to put in your pollinator garden. The other thing to watch out for is um, when you're choosing native plants is that <clears throat> people have been breeding plants for generations and generations. And so, but when we breed plants, we breed them to please us. So for example, um, there are people who are very allergic to the pollen from sunflowers. And so we've developed sunflowers that have no pollen. It's great if you're a person with allergies, but if you're a bee looking for something to take home to feed the, the kids, well, that sunflower just isn't going to do you any good. Okay. Um, sometimes we breed flowers to look pretty and make the shapes very complex with lots of tiny little pebbles all, pebbles all crushed into the center, except the bees can't get in there. So it, it may be great for you, but it's not so great for the bees. So, so look for simple shapes. Keep as close to the original native form as you can. And, oh, I, don't, I, I keep saying there are native plants that support the most native bees, but there are other plants as well that are good for the bees. Herbs come to mind. They like, we, in our pollinator garden here, when we go to look at it, you'll see that we've got some chives and we've got some sage and they're blooming and the bees just love them. So heavy on the native plants, the more native plants you have, the more beneficial insects you're gonna get. But don't forget, there are some other ones. And here's this, since we're doing a program for the library, here's this lovely book called 100 Plants to feed the bees. And it includes mostly native plants, but it also mentions herbs and some other um, good bee plants that are not native, so. In your packet, you have a, a, uh, a, a list of plants that are prevalent in this area that you might want to look at. Uh, there's two lists, the one in each, one in each of two different handouts. Okay, so number three I said was choose variety. So we're looking to have, Mary said that the native bees are in the adult phase for maybe six to eight weeks and they come out at different times of the summer. So if you, they start coming out, well probably right about the time your apple trees start to bloom. So sometime around mid-April. So you want to have at least three different varieties of plants blooming at the same time all the way from mid-April until it freezes in, Oct in, no in October, November, okay? So lots of, of variety in order to get that continuous bloom. I said choose different colors. Um, bees are mostly adapted to attracted to white, blue, and yellow. White and black. And black. Not a lot of black flowers out there. No, but, but the... <laughs> but some. Okay. But some of the other colors are more attractive to other pollinators, like uh, hummingbirds, like red and orange flowers. Okay. So you can attract more than just bees. And the wonderful thing is, if you plant for bees, you're going to also help support other beneficial insects. So it's a good thing. And then when we go look at the um, garden over there, you're going to see that we also have different shapes of flowers. So we've got some penstemon in bloom, which has a tubular flower and the bumblebees just crawl right in there and stick their little butts out. And we have some yarrow blooming 
which has a flat top with lots of individual little tiny flowers on, that make up that flat top. And those flowers are attracted to, attractive to the small bees that maybe would, ha would just get lost in the bigger flowers or the more closed in flowers, okay? They need something wide open and easy to reach that their short tongues can get at without having too much trouble. So your variety is bloom time, bloom color, and flower shape. Okay, then I said, try to plant your flowers in clumps. Okay, three to five of any individual plant. And the way that helps your bees, okay, so we said they may never fly more than a few hundred feet, right? So here's this poor little bee and she comes along and she finds one lonely little, excuse me, so I'll, I'll just leave it there for now. One lonely little bee bomb plant and she sucks up the nectar from that and then she has to fly to the neighbor's yard to find another little bee, bee bomb plant in bloom. Okay, the more she has to fly around to get a full load that she can take home, the fewer trips she can make. So make it easier for her. Give her a big bunch. With our garden here, we did not do a lot of clumping of the plants because we wanted to get a, a bigger variety of plants in for people to be able to see them. But some of them sort of took that and ran with it all on their own. So when we go over there and look at the plants and look at, say, the bee bomb. Oh, Mary, how much bee bomb did we rip out this oh, year? Oh, we did. They, it, <laughs> it spread generously. It made itself a nice big, big clump. So, um, some, so that's why you might not see a ton of clumps over in this garden, but in your garden, if you can do that, that, that will be beneficial for them, okay? And then the last thing that if you have the space and you can do it is to provide spaces that are nesting habitat, ha habitats, excuse me, I'm a little dry. Um, Mary mentioned that like th three almost three quarters of the native bees nest underground. So if you have a space that you can just leave it open and not put down any mulch and not plant it, um, that will be beneficial for ground nesting bees. And on years where the river is kind of low here, they, we get some, a little bit of shoreline there that they might be able to nest in around here. I'm not sure where all they nest around here, but I know we get them. So they're here somewhere. Um, they, they may use, as Mary said, old chipmunk holes or mouse things, mouse tunnels. Um, bumblebees sometimes go under if you have like clumping grasses like we have right over there by the water fountain, by the hose stand. There's some clumps of Carl Forrester, Carl Forrester yes, grass that after the season is over, they kind of flop and, and the, the bees can go underneath and they can be safe and protected there. For, cav for the remaining 25 to 30% of bees that nest in cavities, um, one of the things that you can do is wait to clean up your garden until a little bit later in the spring so that the bees that lay their eggs in hollow stems have a chance for them to hatch out before you take that and throw it in the compost bin or put it out for the city to collect or you know take it to the recycle center um, or if you want to you can you can clean up earlier but save those stems and set them someplace safe until a little bit later and don't get rid of them until a little bit later. So those are a couple of things that you can do. Um, the other thing you can do is you can uh, drill some, if you have some, um, one of your handouts talks about making bee nesting sites out of hollow wood drilling holes and so forth in some wood. Make sure they're deep enough 
make sure that they're the right size and make sure that you have the ability to clean them up after a year or two of use because otherwise insects, not insects, but um, funguses and other diseases can make their home in those same hollow wood spaces as well. So that's what you do for planting for pollinators. Leave habitat. Don't kill them. Choose native plants, do variety, plant in clumps, and leave habitat. So that's what we got. And so we have lots of time for questions. We can go over and look at the garden and see what's over there and in bloom. We also have this lovely tray full of native plants that was donated by Agricol, which is one of the local nurseries. And so if you would like to stay and help us plant, we would be delighted. We have a trowel with your name on it. And these are the recommended kind of plant to use for a pollinator garden. It, we were just so lucky to get this beautiful flat full of great little plants. I'll give you a quick, the two be very best plants <laughs> for bees are if you can only plant a very very small amount the two very best ones are native bee balm which we have some of over here and purple cone flowers they support the greatest number of bees they bloom for a long time uh, they regenerate their nectar very quickly so a bee can come by and drink up what's there and be on its way and it's not that long before another bee can come by and collect a load too so those are two good, really, really good plants if you can only plant a few. So, did anybody have a question? Can you say the name of those two again? Sure, Native Bee Balm. Monarda. And, yeah, it's Monarda, Monarda fistulosa is the Latin name. We have two varieties of Monarda in the garden. We have a short variety that's blooming right now, and you'll see it when you get over there and a taller, a taller variety that's going to bloom in probably a couple of weeks. Yeah, and it's the taller one that's the native one. And the other is purple coneflower. Okay. Other questions? Other interesting observations? Is really bee related? Do hummingbirds pollinate? Hummingbirds do pollinate. They're called accidental pollinators. They. Um, hummingbirds, moths, butterflies, beetles, butterflies, ants to a certain degree, wasps, uh, Some certain bags. types of flies. Yes, thank you. Certain types of flies. So, okay, well, um, I think we can stop recording because I think that's as far as we're going with the talk, talky part and we can walk over and take a look at what's in bloom. Unless yes. you want to follow us with your I camera. For everybody. I don't want to hold people up. No, go ahead, people. ask. First two questions I had were for you. How often do you get stung and what is the, are our bees in this county as bad as they are everywhere dying? Good question. Um, I get stung probably every day. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't, I don't like to wear gloves when I work with my bees because it, it's bulky and it's hot. Um, so, and the second question, uh, how are the bees doing? The bees are doing great. They're so, doing good over here? So, yes, the, the, the bees, um, the honeybees are, are not as in danger as, um, as the native bees are. So if you really want to focus on helping the bees, the native bees are, are where it's at. So, uh, you know, giving them habitat, giving them food to forage on, those are really the things that we can do to help the bees. Um, beekeepers are able to uh, recoup their losses by dividing their colonies every year. So if someone has 10 colonies, they can divide that into 25. And so they can, they can recoup those losses. So. The bees are not uh, as in danger as, as we think they are, so we're doing good. And I have more questions. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Everyone can learn from them. <laughs>
please confirm all Wisconsin native bees dig holes for their home or, or in a tree? Not necessarily. Not, not necess all of them. Not necessarily all of them are ground nesters. There are many ground nesters. I don't have any statistics on that, but, um, uh, but around 75% is all we know. But, but, but in trees uh, but, and logs. Oh, sure. So, yeah, trees, logs. Yeah. Ground ones are right. native. Okay. Your, um, in your handouts, that Wisconsin Bee Identification Guide, it'll tell you for each of them which they are. And some of them have, okay, so it says bumblebees, right? except there are like 17 different varieties of bumblebees. So it may be that some kind, uh, I, there are two or three of them where some of the varieties of that particular bee will nest in the ground and others will nest in cavities. So, but it'll say on the, on the sheet. Okay. And second to the last, do they sleep <laughs> all winter? They don't sleep. They're maturing. They're they're becoming. They're they're. But no, they only no. Live for six oh, weeks, right? uh, you're As talking adults. about yeah. They what what they do. What the females do is make all these brood uh, brood tubes, and then then she dies, and the babies begin in April. Okay, so they like sleep through the winter. Yes. Okay. Yeah. They're, mature, they're but they're constantly maturing during that time. Sure, it's like a baby in the womb. Exactly. Okay, and then you said the ground nests intrigue me. How much space do you need for a ground nest? I know you said some depends, of them are really deep, but... Depends on the bee. And, and for example, if you have a ground nest that has maybe one big hole, you have, it's very difficult to determine how many chambers are underneath that and how deep it goes without actually digging. There has been, Cornell did some, informa did some research on that very topic to see if they could determine how big these got and how much of a, 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 an evidence there would be at, 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 at ground level so that you could tell whether or not. You could have, uh, you could have an underground chamber that was say three by three by three. And it and wouldn't be all hollow. I mean, it would be a, a branch off here and a branch off there. Right, and there would be very little evidence okay. on the surface of the ground. So my, my question was, we just have a small lot. Is it even possible to have it? But if it only takes about this much room. Sure. On the surface, it's going to look a lot like an anthill, but with a little bit bigger hole. Right. Okay, now I'll leave you alone. <laughs> Anybody else? Good questions. They are good questions. Anyone? Well, let's go see what's in blue. Yeah, let's go look at the garden. <laughs> so these are my chive plants, and they've already finished blooming. But if you look, oh, let's see if I can find one. There's, I see some seeds right. No, maybe mm -hmm. not. I thought I saw one maybe over here. Anyway, they're, pretty soon they'll, they'll have seeds, and they'll dump the seeds <laughs> out on the ground, and then they'll plant more chives. And you'll notice everybody here, this little, it looks like a dog waterer, which is exactly what it is. I took a, an old dog waterer and put blue marbles in it. Because bees are attracted to blue. And bees need to have something to walk on in order to get their drink. They need to have a surface. They, we couldn't just fill this with water and say, here bees, here's your water. This makes it easier for the bees to get to their water. They have something to walk on that is solid and, and it's a color that they like because it's blue. And um, so this is a very, very simple, very easy water that anyone can make. Yeah. You have to clean that out every so often. Periodically. Yes. It gets kind mm -hmm. of grody if you don't. Yep. This is Russian sage. Um, we just, yeah. I just picked this up one day because it was, uh, end of season and a beautiful little plant and it has just been really a success um, a lot of the bees like that we have lilies here red day lilies um, we have different types of well Ruth go ahead I, like we said not all of the plants are native the day lilies are not native the I, over here I've got well I've got this beautiful salvia down here that's blooming and explain about the other little plants that are inside the salvia. You guys see this? It's a little bit different plant. 
There's another one right here. Does anybody recognize it? It is um, Orange. Thank you, because I wouldn't have been able to pick that name out of the blue. Yeah, it's it has it, it's going to grow up. As you can see, this is starting to send up a flower stalk, and then each of these little buds will open into a blue flower, and the bumblebees just love them. And those plants self-seeded. We didn't that's do why anything to make those other <laughs> that's plants. That's why come. they're all growing out of this they, salvia. They apparently blew the seeds, apparently blew over into the shade of that little plant and thought, this is a nice place. I'm going to sprout right here. This little guy is called Silene regia, um, bright red. Uh, and that's a kind of a tubular little plant, the, the blossom. Uh, and bees like it. And okay, We're so. headed somewhere, Ruth. I know you were. No, that's fine. We're good. Um, this, this is that flat-topped one that has, is made up of lots of individual little flowers. That one's a yarrow. This one, there you can see the seed pods on it. This one is almost finished blooming, and those seed pods are going to turn black. Wish you could have seen it a couple of weeks ago. It was just spectacular. I think we may have a blossom or two left. Just try to imagine the whole thing. Yeah, there we go. There's a blossom. Baptisia. They look like pea blossoms. Yes, it looks. But a they're bit... blue. Yep. Yep, that's Baptisia. And then this beautiful, beautiful clump behind me. These are penstemon, and we had bumblebees. Oh, galore! Crawling up in there earlier. Here's a butterfly passing through. So we've got. Lots of things that are going to bloom later. Right, right. we have a Tennessee coneflower that's coming right here. And this Tennessee coneflower is a very unusual one. The petals don't arc down, they, they arc up. up. It's a very unique little cultivar and a very pretty little plant. And then, Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yep, there it is. Oh, here's a bumblebee right here. Nosing its way around the penstemon there. So I mentioned that bee balm is one of the really good plants for bees. So this one is a cultivated variety called Prairie Gypsy. And this taller one in the front here is going to be a really pale purple. And that's the native one. And it's there, and it's there, and it's there. <laughs> So lots of it. Oh, and here that I do have a. If you can come around this way a little bit, can you see this? Well, maybe I'll just pluck it off because I have lots more of them up top. Uh, Isn't that, that a is pretty so cool. flower? Okay, how but, many of you know that monarch butterfly caterpillars? only eat plants in the milkweed family. Did you know that? Okay, so when we say milkweed, most people think of this. This is common milkweed. Right. Okay, but this is butterfly milkweed. So they can eat this. And you see that we have several plants. Yep. Right along or in a One, row here. One, two, three. Three, right. And they're coming along and this one is red swamp milkweed. So this one will take a location that has a little wetter soil. So if, if a plant, if you can't get that milkweed to do well or this milkweed to do well, try, try this, this milkweed. Yes. Okay. Um, right next to Ruth, there is a kind of a silvery looking little bush. This, this, is, a, this is called Royal. I think it's Blue Night. Blue, yeah, blue night, and it's um, it blooms very late in the year, and it blooms blue, yes. which is not a color that we get very often late in the year. Usually, by the time we get to the end of the year, we're getting a lot of yellow. This one is blue, so the bees will be attracted to that as well. We had lots of little ones coming up that we had oh, to take yes. out. Um, this is going to shoot up. This plant, it's going to shoot up to about here. 
It's a liatris and it's going to have purple blossoms that bloom from the top of the stalk going down. So it starts at the top and then the blooms go down, 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 which is the reverse of the usual order. And off to Ruth's right there is something that you may not rec recognize immediately. That's plain old ordinary garden sage. Have a sniff and pass it around. And it has, I believe we have some blossoms on that. Yep. Right, right here. These are, are pretty much spent. Oh, we have a few left, okay. There's so much of this plant, I don't feel bad ripping it out. Okay, so those blossoms are good. So I said before that herbs are good plants for the bees. So that's why we have this in here. So, um, I believe that we have ironweed somewhere in there. Yes, we do. It is this one right here. And it's going to have purple paint cup type flowers late in the season. This one is a fall bloomer. Um, anybody have any questions about anything? What was the white one again? This white one here and this purpler version of it, uh, they're both penstemon. Um, You'll find it in a pollinator garden like this, an awful lot of self-seeding takes place and little actual Eba. maintenance. We don't do that much to maintain this garden. We, if we see something that doesn't look well, we, we might consider it. You know, we, might, we might work on that issue. But the object with a, a pollinator garden like this is kind of to let it go. And you'll notice that one of the things that we have here is very familiar. Dandelions. We do not get rid of dandelions. They are one of the first things that bees feed on in the spring. Yeah, I'm always struggling because the, you have to mow. You can't just leave oh, the grass. Yeah, and I suppose that, you know, I love to, the, to see these lawns that are might be a green carpet, it's so beautiful. But there's no nutrient there for, for the, the occasional passing bumblebee or whatever. Have you heard about No Mo May? Yes, but I was just, just brought it up because the city makes you, ma makes you mow. Um, be a big green nectar. Yeah, there's a bumblebee here and a bumblebee here. Wow, that bumblebee is very cool um, Several cities, including Fort Atkinson uh, and several others have yep, joined the No Mo May movement. And they, one of the things that they strongly recommend is that if you are not going to mow for May, put up a sign so your neighbors know that's what you're doing. Because otherwise they'll just think you're neglecting. You'd be, and surprised, instead, how, you'd be surprised how supportive people that you didn't think had a clue can be uh, when you're doing something this positive and this important. Yeah, spring uh, my is neighbors the were very, time for the very bees. cool. So, yep. yep. Could be a teaching opportunity for them. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> anything else? Let's see, we've got a goldenrod here, which is a little bit unusual one. We have this one too, Ruth. Remember this? Uh, the mountain mint. Right, mountain mint. You can't There's see it. There's a monarda it. at the front. The mountain mint is farther back here towards the, uh, this is the mountain mint right. here. And you can see the mountain mint has a flat headed blossom. They're really insignificant. They're nothing to write home to mom about. But they're one of the best bee plants. Mark Dwyer told me, he said, you gotta have one of those, Mary. You gotta put it in your pollinator garden. The first one he ever saw was in Washington state he said he could hear the bees humming from across the lawn. There were so many bees that were feeding on this particular plant. So it's a, it's a highly uh, choice plant for a pollinator garden. Yeah. One thing that we did run into, I, I think I mentioned about self-seeding. You can look around the garden <laughs> and a number of places you'll see hyssop. That's this plant right here. Right. We, I think we started with what, two? Two. And There's we've got here, clusters here, and clusters. Here, 
We yep. ripped out a bunch. There's some over there. So. You do have to maybe take charge a little bit when things start to overgrow. Uh, as Ruth said, we did pull out an awful lot of Monarda this in a, just a couple of weeks ago, actually. Yeah. Uh, and uh, already it's made a, a difference in the way things look. Yeah. So here's a, a funky looking plant. It's got little oh. spines on the leaves. Yeah. Does anybody know what it is? It's got a very unusual name. No? It's called Rattlesnake Master. And, and it has it, large blue, uh, white globes. Perfectly globular. And they're covered with little prickers. And you would never think that it would be a pollinator plant, but it is. But the bees love it. Yep. Yep. So it's this one right here. It almost looks like a desert plant. Yes, that's a very good analogy. Well, um, they feel pretty soft right now, but the plant is pretty young. So it may be that later on in the season, as things get drier, they get more prickery. Is it a balloon flower? I'm not sure what else it's called. Is that it's, a native? Or? It's not a native. Um, do you get lots of bees yeah, out of it? Yeah, that's prolific. Uh-huh. Yeah. So there you go. So good for you. If, it, if they love it, it's a pollinator plant. Yeah, pollinator Let's plant. just think of it that way. Pretty. Yes, it is. Yes. Yes, it yep. is. Okay, so we have some plants to plant if anybody would like to help. That. Okay. Yes, good. I'm going to let these go right down here. Okay. All right. Any, any last questions before we move on to planting? Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with this particular spot. We have a picture of this before we started the pollinator garden. It was a circle full of brown mulch, <laughs> period. That was it. That's not so that we long start ago. It's like four years four ago. Four years ago. We started with 28 different varieties of plants. We have since modified that, and we constantly keep modifying. We, keep, we bring things in. Uh, we or they decide, bring themselves. Yeah, or, or we wean things out, things that are inappropriate or not doing well or whatever. Yeah. So it isn't that we don't do any maintenance at all. We just don't do very much. Do you have kind of a list of some of these, the ones that you... Actually, we do. Um, I have it at home <laughs> on my computer. Yeah. Um, but the lists that you have from your hands out, handouts, if there's anything in particular that you see that you would like to know, I'd be happy to tell you. But otherwise, your handouts will give you a, they won't steer you wrong. And if you are really looking for a good one, if any of you heard of the Xerxes Society, strange word. The Xerxes Society is named after the Xerxes Blue Butterfly, which is the first butterfly that was known to have died because of the acts of man. It was it was uh, became extinct in the late 40s, and it is it was just it was this beautiful ethereal little tiny thing, blue kind of gray, a couple of eyes on its wings, absolutely gorgeous. And so they chose to name their organization after this little butterfly. And the Xerxes, um, it's the Xerxes Society for Invertebrate Conservation. It's yep. a big, long, scary name, but these are some really fabulous people. This book is one of many that came from Xerxes. If you want to find out more about bees, go Another to the pollinators. Xerxes Society on, online. Oh, okay, that's how you spell it. X-E-R-C-E-S, um, -E -E Xerxes. And that'll, there's information on that in the handouts as well. The, the, that top handout there that you have with the pictures, yeah, that plant list is from Xerxes. Yes, that's one of their, their um, there are areas where things do better. And uh, they have all, anything, if you want to, if you live in Washington State, they've got one for that. If you live in California, they've got one for that. It's yeah. just, it's a wonderful resource, wonderful resource. And I showed you that book before that said 100 Plants to Feed the Bees. They've just come out with one called 100 Plants to Feed the Monarchs. So if you are particularly interested in monarchs, that would be one to look for. Can you see a monarch egg? 
Can you see them on a plant? They're pretty inconspicuous and it's a maybe a teeny bit early right now, but soon if not you know, it's, it's not the generation that's going to fly down to Mexico yet. Did you know that? They fly down to Mexico every yeah. year. Very cool. It's, um, it's amazing to me how many people have taken to rearing monarchs. Many. Just, I mean, you know, maybe a half a dozen in a year or a dozen or whatever. Just people in their backyards or in their sun porch or wherever. It's just, it's an amazing thing. And it's really heartening because it, it makes us believe that uh, there are really good people out there. Yeah. People do care. And you can, this is, sometimes the problem is so big, it's, it's daunting to think about trying to do anything. But with this, you really can make a big difference. You can. And this is important. This is the life of solitary bees and what we do in response to those little creatures is probably going to be one of the most, it, it's, it's probably going to be a defining moment in man's history. If we lose, if we lose these insects, we're done. We're toast. Studies in Europe say that not just pollinators, but insects across the board yep. in the last 40 to 50 years, populations have declined by 70%. So it's huge. Pretty scary. So, okay, plants. Five things that are basic to human life. It's, I can't remember the whole list. It's been algae, bees. There's five things that we have to have. That makes or sense. Were, or we're toast. We're toast. <laughs> Okay, let's see what we've got for planting. Oh. Thank you very much. You're